I actually can hear myself up here for a change. I don't know what the deal is with that. That's great. <laughs> Hey, I, I, I heard something the other day I thought was uh, quite interesting uh, in a congregation that was really active of people hustling, bustling. There's all kinds of characters that are in there, and that's us. We're characters. Uh, there was a lady named Sally Sue and a guy named Jack, and uh, Jack was quiet spoken and didn't uh, really have a whole lot to say and rather reserved, but Sally Jo, uh, she was the town gossip. Had her town, even bought a house that was out on the major fairway in a small town so she could keep track of everybody as they passed by and was always chattering away, gossip, 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 and didn't matter what it was. And uh, one day she saw that uh, uh, Jack's uh, pickup was parked in front of Ted's bar. And it was there all night long. <laughs> Boy, she couldn't wait to make a beeline to church, and she was just... Da -da 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 -da. And by the time everybody arrived and before they left and all that stuff, she even put her two cents in. I saw your pickup there, and I have let everybody know what a backslider you are. You know? And he started to respond, and he sat there quietly and thought... She's, and, and she went on and on. You know, I got the proof. I saw it. I'm a witness of it. Everybody else seen it. You know, you're, you're, you're a backslider. You need to repent. <laughs> and just spread and slander and all that stuff. And he thought and thought and didn't say anything. He went on and next uh, Sunday, uh, she woke up and there was his pickup. He had left it in front of her house all night long. <laughs> So, uh, I can tell you that we reap what we sow, so be careful what you sow with your words. They should be filled with goodness and kindness and the presence of the Lord, and we shouldn't be talking about anybody's character, except the character of our Lord, of how much more we need it. Yeah, we don't have a problem in that area, as far as I know, praise God. Uh, all that stuff has uh, been driven out of us by the Spirit. Now, I would like to, in our thought process, there were several words that have come forth uh, that were uh, just absolutely mesmerizing. One was about all the judgments God's going to be pouring out upon our nation, particularly. Now, we wouldn't be so concerned if it was being poured out on Iraq or Iran, right? <laughs> I mean, we watched as God unleashed some judgments there. And what did it bring? It brought a form of righteousness for a little while. Anytime God puts forth judgments, it means that he's going to try to bring forth a form of righteousness. Matter of fact, his whole scheme in coming back and being king of the earth is that he wants to make the earth a righteous place again. And what's wrong with that? We ought to be standing up and cheering for that. All the angels are, when, when all the everything is unleashed down here on earth and everything's turned upside down and... The Lord is returning. Uh, it says all the angels are singing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory unto God. Glory unto the highest. They're praising and worshiping him. Now, I think we've got this kind of backwards because we're carnal. That's not carnal as in a corn kernel. That's carnal as in fleshly. A piece of raw meat <laughs> that wants to do its own thing, its own way, its own will. We have a sense of stubbornness about us and stiff necks about us that constantly cost us what God had in mind for us. You, you heard the expression to cut your nose off to spite your face, you know. You get so mad about something, someone, can you imagine, ask somebody to cut their nose off. I'll teach you face, and they cut their nose off. Now, I, I don't know where that expression came from, but I, I've heard that years ago, and my boss told me that one time, and, uh, huh? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean by that? <laughs> and, and he meant what he said, and, and, and I, 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 it took me a while to get it. That uh, this was years and years ago when I was a young bronc and needed a little instruction and was too stiff-necked to receive it. You know, there's always people who have authority above us, but very few people go to those who are in authority and say, hey, how do I change this? Or how do I do this? Or 
how can I, how can I, how can I? Instead, we just tumble on down the river doing things our own way, swimming upstream. Now, my brother and I, we used to live in Eugene, Oregon. We lived at 151 Heilman Lane in Eugene, Oregon, which was right, it was a road that ended right out by the Willamette River. It was about four miles downstream after the McKenzie and the Willamette River met. And so it made a pretty good, pretty good frog pond. You know, matter of fact, I, I remembered about the same size as the Skagit River that goes through here because both rivers had come together. It was a pretty good sized river. Now, my brother and I, we were from the south, and in the south, it's hot. And when it's hot, uh, frogs fry, and so do people, so we all get in the water, and we were really good swimmers. I mean, we were good swimmers. When I look at people up here, and I live in the northwest now, and well, of course nobody wants to get in the water. I mean, the water is, you know, 40 degrees or 30 degrees. Nobody, so there's not real strong swimmers here. But we came up to Oregon, and the Willamette River dumps out of the Cascade Mountains up there, just like it does here. And, and uh, so we thought, water, praise God, this is wonderful. And I can remember uh, there was this gravel pit. And this big bridge, and it was a wooden bridge that went on down to the river, but it had been washed out around it. So there's a plank that went over to the wooden bridge. And there's a huge gravel pit there. And you could look down into it, and the water was absolutely crystal clear. I mean, it was probably, I want to say, 30, 40 feet deep like that. And I can remember thinking I'm standing on that bridge, probably 15 feet off the water, maybe a little bit further. And you know what? I'm just going to dive down because I don't think I can go 40 feet trying to swim down. But coming off this bridge, I can probably make it down to the bottom. And I did. I did. But I was in hyperventilating shock before I got back to the surface because that water was so cold. <laughs> I was a good, strong swimmer. And uh, it didn't take me long to get back to the surface. But uh, I enjoyed the water and I would get out. And my brother and I used to go down to the Willamette River and... Uh, it was on down about two more blocks. This was a washout area, too. And we would get in the river, and we knew, being from the Texas area, we swam in the rivers down there, that, yeah, you know, it's easy to swim in a river. Unless, of course, you want to go upstream. <laughs> I, I mean, I tried that in some pretty fast-paced rivers, and you just don't go nowhere. You can just get tarter and tarter and tarter. Now, so my brother and I, we, we, we knew about rivers, but we didn't know necessarily about cold rivers. And we would go swimming in that river all the time, all summer long. We'd go swimming in that river. You know why we swam in it? We'd walk downstream until we find a nice place that had, and then everything is cobblestones, you know, if you get around the rivers or, or, or gravel. And so we'd find a nice place, and we'd go upstream maybe a couple of miles. And you know the way we swam in the river? You get in a river, and you flowed with the river to the getting that point. And it was no struggle. It was just bumping along. Oh, isn't this beautiful? This is wonderful. Then if it got a little bit faster, it was woohoo! <laughs> On down we would go until we got to the getting out place. Now, my thought process about this is we're in the end times. Our Lord Jesus Christ is getting ready to come back. And we can fight the current with fear. We can fight the current with dread. We can fight the current with nervousness. Oh, I'm so nervous. All hell's going to break loose. The world's going to fry all those pretty buildings that we love. And worse than that, the politicians are going to be burned up. What are we going to do? I mean, we're just all broken hearted about the wrong thing. And this is Jesus Christ, our King, that wants to return. This is Jesus Christ, our King, that wants to come and bring righteousness to the face of the earth. This is Jesus Christ who will speak to us more and more and more in the last days. This is Jesus Christ who is willing to pour out His Spirit upon us and the Holy Spirit upon us more in the last days than the apostles had it. How well did the apostles, were, how well were they anointed? Didn't tongues of fire drop out of the heavens? Didn't, didn't, weren't they filled with the Spirit of God? And weren't they given the language of angels? I've been thinking about that. I can just see a whole... Because every time I read a commentary, and, 
and 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 listen to some of the high powered falutin guys about tongues. I, I hear the oh, well, that's ecstatic tongues. You know what they mean by ecstatic tongue? They mean that the Buddhists speak in an ecstatic tongue. The Arab women, you know, with the big veils, and you see their horsemen running, and and they get spear checkers and all that stuff, and they're fixing to kill somebody, and they're going, no, 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 you know, you've you've seen those things on TV, right? That's an ecstatic tongue. That's what they're saying that God speaks. And I can just see a couple of angels coming into session, listening to the theologians. Oh, yeah, it's just an ecstatic tongue. And they look at each other. Can you get these guys? And they just throw a laugh. They look at each other. Do I sound like this to you? And then they just bust up laughing. And they think, what? Morons. This is a language we speak before the living God. And we offered it to them, and they have the audacity to come and, and say that it's, it's something rude, lewd, and crude, and something of Satan, and something of demonic forces, and something that men can make up. I'm sure they look at each other and say, are you making that up? <laughs> when they're talking to, I, I don't think so. And I think that if God has poured out his spirit in those days, and we saw those days, we've had three great revivals that have come forth, and it's all as a result of the Holy Spirit being poured out, but something else being poured out in the midst of that. And that's the revelational gospel. And there's part of the problem. Those who have come to give us the gospel, some of them weren't speaking the gospel through the Holy Spirit, but yet there's a passage of Scripture that says, when the gospel, when those who were sent with the gospel preach the gospel to you through the Spirit. So the gospel is not just a matter of reading something. The gospel is a matter of the Holy Spirit delivering it. Elsewise, it's not the gospel. It has to be filled with the Holy Spirit not man's knowledge, not man's terminology, not man's cursory actions and comments. Not anything to do with man. I think since we realize that judgments are coming, we need to realize something greater is coming. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Someone greater is coming. He's coming back. Our thought process, the whole hope that's supposed to be stirred within us... And, and, and I can find, I can, I can get a spiritual thermometer out and poke it in somebody's mouth. And it gets up to about four degrees and think, hmm, cold heart. Okay, take this. And what that is, it's an inspiring message, spirit-led message. And come back and I'll check your temperature again. <laughs> and come back. Oh, we're up to 25 degrees. <laughs> you know, here, here, here here's, here's 15 messages and they come back and the temperature now they're warm-blooded there's finally within them a reaction and a thought process of of being set on fire for god now every one of us at a time in our life has been touched by god that caused something to be stirred within us that a fire ignited that god is real that he's alive, that he's standing in our midst, that he wants to speak to us. He wants to give us a revelation of himself. He wants, to, uh, he wants to express. And when we make those discoveries, it's not just us making those. It's the spirit that has all of a sudden opened the door. And, and we get excited because, oh, my goodness, spiritual things are real. Oh, my goodness, God, you're real. Well, part of our hope that we don't talk about very much is supposed to be encapsulated and wrapped around the hope of his return. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and Paul were always talking about his return, his return. Jesus made a statement in John chapter 14, if I go to prepare I if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may also be. Then he makes a statement, and you know the way where I'm going. We often forget the way where he's going. Because if he is preparing a place for us, we're supposed to pay, stay on the path of where he's going so that we're on that pathway that we can meet him in his return. Now, I, I I'm a, I was, was raised a good evangelical, which we did most of our preaching and thinking around the thought of just live your life for yourself, claim to be Jesus Christ, try to, try to stay clean. And then the whole event was his return. 
His return is supposed to be imminent in our thought process. Imminent so much that we learn how to walk with him now on the path that he chooses so that we can hear his voice. That's the purpose of us recognizing, oh, you can pop in just at any moment. Well, that keeps our mind circulating around the right processes of keeping our love fresh. Keeping it renewed, stirring up inside us those things he's already said and those things he's already done. If we would only become obedient to those things he's already said, then there would be more revelation that would be put on the table. Why? It's be, like I, I receive a map, and it's a section of a map. It's this section. And it's got a trail on it, and I'm supposed to go to that point. Well, I can carry the map around, and, but if I never identify where I'm at, I can never identify how to get to that place. And if I'm not willing to get to that place, if I never follow those directions, I'll never get at that place. And I have to get at that place because if I get to that place, then there's a transfer of the next set of instructions of where I'm supposed to go and how I'm supposed to. So obedience is important in this. If you want more revelation of God, if you want him to reveal himself more, our Lord Jesus Christ, if you want more direction and a simple, easy ride. It was a simple, easy ride for me and my brother. All we had to do is get in the water. The water did all the work. It got us downstream. One time we decided, well, we want to go to some islands. And there were some islands, so we went upstream about three miles. And we just drifted casually over to those islands. We didn't have to. And, 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 and now this comes by a little bit of experience because we started at the, the north end of the island one day trying to swim directly across the river, swimming as hard as we could. And we made the south end, but boy, we were plumb tuckered out. Now the thing was, it was a small island and there was deer on it. And we just wanted to chase them around the island, you know, beating Tom Sawyers and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, after we had that experience, we thought, you know, that would be an easier way to get to the island. <laughs> Well, of course, go further upstream and float over to it instead of wearing yourself out before you get there. Because, I mean, if you're going to catch a deer, it's going to take a lot of running to do that. And if you're worn out the time you get there, uh, it, it, you're not going to catch that deer. Because we never caught the deer, but you know how we can think. We're going to catch something. And my point being is, if we obey the truth, the Scripture says that the truth will do what? Anybody know? Okay, but there's also another passage of Scripture that says, if we obey the truth, the truth will purify us. Do you ever wonder how we get purified in this? Because we're, we're constantly, oh, Lord, please purify me. And we won't follow the map. Now, he, he, he's in that map, he says, don't go down this street. Now, how many of you have been down that street? Did something come to mind? <laughs> Are you on that street? <laughs> Did you make a little side trip into the church off of that street? Are you waiting to go back to that street from the church? So the Lord gives us some instructions through the Spirit of what street to be on. Now you can be on the street of, uh, how many of you ever been on the street? You're on the way to the church and, you know, your wife looks at you cross-sided and meows like a cat and you what did you say? <laughs> and you get here and you got to go, I'm so happy. And inside you're raging, the day is spoiled. Well, it's only spoiled because we're on Angry Eyes Street. Remember Mr. Potato Head, you know? He carried his angry eyes with him, and he carried his fat lips with him, and he carried a pair of glasses with him. He had all these different things. I don't know if you've seen Toy Story or not, but his wife really loads him up <laughs> until his eyes are bulging, you know? And so we've got all these things thrown inside of us that we can use if we want, and we're supposed to not have any of those things inside of us. I don't see on the map that it says take Angry Street anywhere. I don't see on the map where it says I'm supposed to take Frustration Street anywhere. I don't see on the map 
Matter of fact, it tells me stay off of the gutter street. I, I don't understand. Why does he want me to stay off the gutter street? You know, if I took that little exit there, I could get there a lot quicker. Because it's real close to the place that, that, that he wants me to go. So he gives me a whole set of instructions of what streets to take and what streets to stay off of. Now, why is he doing this? Now, Jesus makes the statement. Oh, there, there goes some notes. <clears throat> Jesus makes the statement that uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, those are the three streets that we need, right? The way, the truth, and the life. That's not hard. I remember in California, if you wanted to go north to south, you would take the Camino Real. It didn't matter where you were in California. It went from northern California all the way to southern California if you were on the Camino Real. It didn't matter what city you were in. It didn't matter what county that you went through. That particular street, the name of that street, stuck. And you could take that Anywhere north and south in the whole state of California. Now, California is about 800 miles long, north to south, something like that. It didn't matter if you were going through L.A. If you stayed on it, you would end up in San Diego. didn't matter if you're in San Diego. If you stayed on it, you could end up in San Francisco because it went somewhere. So the way, that's Jesus' way. That's the pathway. That's getting into the river of him. The river of his purposes. Now, see, we want to get into the objective of, oh, you want me there. Yeah, I'll become that. Uh, I'll start working on that. We don't want to flow with him. Instead, we want to arrive at the objective and say we fulfill the objective. And when we get there, he said, I didn't want you to come to the objective. I just want you to get in the river and learn how to flow in life in the spirit. Isn't that what he did when he was here? He was born dirt poor as a little carpenter in a, a little shoebox manger thing where animals had their muzzles probably a couple hours before he was born with some fresh straw and hay. Then he worked through life of being a carpenter, made a few trips down to Egypt and was hunted, watched his father die and ended up being a supporter of his family. He went through the same things we went through. And don't you know there was some times of need in there? There was also some times of God's abundant supply to make provision for them. Now my point is, is he flowed all of his days with his father. My point is, if he's returning, he's going to come back as a thief in the night. I love the way he puts that. He says, you're not going to know the hour or the day. Now, you can know the season. And are we in that season? I can give you 23 different scriptures that talk about why this is a season. One of those is when the Gentiles no longer occupy, rule, Jerusalem. The day you see them stop ruling there, the clock started ticking. When was that? 1948, Israel became a nation again. 1967. Part of Jerusalem was taken, so the clock started on that particular prophecy, throwing us into the last days, because that was a significant prophecy, because it was after 2,000 years of desolation that Israel became a nation again. And I can tell you, I can remember as a kid, there was even questioning in the world whether Israel ever even existed or not. They thought it was something fable, like the Knights of Camelot or something. You know, and, and what was that, that castle that they, that, pardon? King yeah, King Arthur. And, uh, you know, that we, we look at that as a fable. Well, my, in my early childhood, most of the people looked at Israel as, oh, well, it was just a fable. David was just a fable. And, of course, it was owned by the Arabs, and they had torn down and cut out everything that was connected to that. But finally, after Israel got in there, there was all kinds of evidence of no. That was their city, that was their towns, there was, there, everything was as it says in the scripture, identical to. And my thought process around that is, if it's identical to that, isn't there a kingdom that he's making for us right now? And he says that you'll know the way there. He says that he's gone to build a place for it. He said there's many mansions in my father's house, and I could go off on a tangent on that one. There's many dimensions in my father's house. 
Remember the ten different dimensions we talked about? Place of the dead, the earth, second dimension, third dimension, where the fourth dimension where God is. And we don't know about the rest of them. We think and assume that there's ten of those. But Jesus, my point is, is he's been working. He has been working, preparing a place for us. So there's some things that we, we need to realize. And I'm going to say about ten of them. One, we need to understand the times and the seasons that are coming up. Two, we need to recognize the signs of the seasons. See? Number one, we need to understand the times and seasons. Number two, we need to recognize the signs. Jesus makes the statement to the Pharisees. He said, you can tell if it's a red sky that the next day it's going to be sunny instead of cloudy. You weather predictors, you. They had weathermen back then just like we do today. They were called Pharisees. And then oh, they get an epiphany. Oh, I got a prophecy. Uh, it's going to be clear tomorrow. And they can see the red sky. <laughs> so he's really chiding them and saying, you fools. You can, you, you, you're prophesying that away, but you can't even predict the times and signs. And this is the times and signs were that the Messiah was coming and the Messiah was standing right in front of them. And he's saying, you fools, you, can't, you don't even know the signs and the times and you don't know the seasons. So we need to become aware of the times and seasons, number one. Number two, we need to recognize the signs of those seasons. And then in the midst of that, if we think he's coming back, is there anything we're supposed to be doing? I, I can remember uh, going to work for an insurance company, and it was a novelty insurance company. It was the number one making money-making insurance company in the U.S. that I went to f work for at one time. And it was just simply because it was privately owned by a man who started it. And it had about, I guess, 2,500 employees. And when I went to work for them, they flew me down to spend some time there. And I was absolutely astonished. They had playgrounds for kids. They had a dry cleaning plant there in the building. They had a cafeteria there. They had built a lake and stocked it with fish for the employees. They had baseball practice and baseball teams and soccer teams and they had a gymnasium built and an exercise room built. They had a daycare, because if you had kids, it, 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 it basically what their thought was is if you become our employee, we want you to mold your life into us and we want to help mold our lives into you. And boy, it was a great company to work for in the early days. Their thought process is they wanted the best employees, the most knowledgeable, without problems. They wanted people that could really do the job. And they were willing to pay 25% more than anybody else in the United States to get the cream of the crop of people because they realized here we're going to be spending billions of dollars on claims and writing policies and we want the best people that there is because you can give away money by the boatload when a claim shouldn't be paid. And when it's supposed to be paid, you can lose a boatload if you didn't pay it <laughs> in court. <laughs> that my, my, my point in throwing that in the equation, there was a whole life that was there. I told Jackie about it when I got back. And, and uh, I, I, I stood absolutely amazed that they really wanted to integrate. The office life was one of non-hostility, one of really wanting to help you grow. They had a Promote Yourself program. They had all kinds of things to help you grow and become a part of them so that your life was not independent of them but instead interactive. If you had friends, they wanted those friends to be people you work with. If you had... A vacation company coming, 
They wanted that. Well, how about, you know, you, you and somebody in your department or and, and they, they if you they even offered to send me to law school. They said, we'll pay for it. They really were thinking about the employee knowing that they out of that extracting of the best and the cream of the crop, they became the number one money making company in the United States because they hired the best people but really treated him with kid gloves. My, my whole point in giving you that scenario is when we come into Christ, he's expecting us to transfer our thought process from our own ways, our little private world of don't interrupt me, I've got my little huddle over here, and uh, what, what can I take to bring it over here? What can I get and I'll, I'll bring it over here? Because I've got to make this a, 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 a safe place for me. Jesus is saying, give that up and come and be a part of his society. He wants to build a family. And inside his family, he's got a promote yourself program. Obey him. If you become obedient to him, then he promotes you. In, that provo in the promotions come the, the uh, provisions. So we need to cultivate that relational functionality in his kingdom, in the, in the kingdom of God. You realize this is the extension of the kingdom of God. We're meeting in an extension of the kingdom of God on a corporate basis right now. If we're meeting in that, then we're supposed to cultivate holiness. You know what holiness is? Oh, that means when I don't get to have no fun anymore, is what somebody told me one time. <laughs> no, that means you separate yourself out. If you went down and you joined one of the, let's we'll say you joined one of the national footlog, football teams, that means you can no longer play football for anybody else. <laughs> that means that they're on the road playing. That means you show up for practice. But it also means you get a paycheck from them. It also means they have a doctor that's going to help you. And that also means they've got a trainer that's going to help you. And it also means that they're thinking about, now, we've got to make provision for you because we know that you, we don't want you to have to worry about your family. And they've got all kinds of things that the family can do and how the families can interact so that the players know their families are taken, off, taken care of while they're off playing somewhere. And they have all kinds of chaperones with them to help them not get into too much trouble when they're on the road being alone. They've got, they, 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 I remember the Dallas Cowboys when I was uh, young, uh, when Roger Staubach was there. It was called the nation's team. It was almost heralded as the Christian team of the United States. Why? Because the players were. The coach was. Their ideas and their morals were wrapped around that. And as a result, God really blessed them. And my thought process around this is if we're going to cultivate holiness, that means cultivate a separateness unto God to be in his family. When they flew me down to Miami, they spent a pile of money, probably 20000 bucks before I got back. They were cultivating and allowing me, giving me an opportunity to cultivate relationships with the major bosses so that we had really peace. That if one of them called and said, I want this done, I don't have to say, well, explain to me why, and we don't have to go through three hours of conversation of why and why not. Instead, oh, sure, I'll get right on that, sir. It doesn't matter what it was. I, I was supposed to be cultivating that relationship or separateness into that. So God wants us to cultivate a holy relationship with each other in his kingdom and with him. Right relationships are important to him. So that was number three. Number four, we are supposed to be aware and become aware of his purposes. If he's coming, I'm giving you a list of ten things we need to do. One, the fourth or fifth thing on the list is become aware of his purposes and his promises. What is his purpose? See, Jesus is just coming back. And it'd be like uh, uh, Nehemiah when he went down to Jerusalem and he took a bunch of people with him down there. What was their purpose in returning? It was to build the walls, right? A king let them go out of slavery to go build something. So it doesn't make sense that if 
we're supposed to be working on God's walls that we set up Sam's hot dog stand. Does it? If the Lord returns and I'm in Sam's hot dog stand trying to make a profit, he's going to look at me and say, why weren't you working on the wall? Do, do you agree with that understanding? So we don't want to be caught off guard because he says he's coming like a thief in the night. Do you know why he calls it a thief in the night? Everything belongs to him. He can't be a thief. But you remember the, the guy with the one talent and the other guys had talent? The guy with the one talent said, well, I hit it in the ground. I knew you were a hard so-and-so, and, -so and I, I knew you'd, you, you reaped where, you know, you didn't even work for it. I'm the one that worked for it, so I put it in the ground. And he said, well, if you knew I was hard so-and-so, you, you should at least put it in the bank and done something with it. And my point is that our Lord is imminently getting closer to the return and we have ever been before. And the apostles and prophets says they long to live in our day. It didn't matter to them if earthquakes were going to come. It didn't matter that woodworm was going to hit the earth. And there was going to be a tidal wave and a third of mankind blown out with the water and drowned and the, the fishes in the sea. It didn't matter to them that, that the, there was going to be great cities devastated with earthquakes. It didn't matter to them that coals of fire were going to be falling from heaven for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to be here. Now, I, we were a bunch of whiners and moaners. We're all, oh, I wish I lived in the apostles' time. Boy, I, you'd be miserable. Because we've got it. We've got, we are in Cushland here. We were born with a silver spoon in our mouth, even if you were under a bridge compared to third world countries. If you've ever been to third world countries, you understand the people under the bridge, if they really wanted it, could have a nice place to live before sundown. Free. Could have hot meals. Free. Clothes. Free. A job if they wanted it. All those things are available. I know Jack and I used to go down and help feed the poor into the under the bridge on Sunday afternoon and preach the gospel and had about 500 people and and I can tell you out of 500 people there may be I mean, we'd have an altar call and there'd be maybe 100 that would come but but when it really came down to it there was maybe one or two that really want to change their lives they wanted they wanted the rights to do what they wanted to do and in the rights to do what they wanted to do they ended up in constant poverty they're willing to accept poverty so that they can do what they want to do. You can't help somebody that wants poverty so they can do what they want to do. God looking at us and saying, do you want poverty or do you want to do what I want to do? Because if you want to do what you want to do, it's going to bring poverty. But then he gives us these warnings and, 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 and I, I don't want to settle in on the warnings. I want to settle in on our great king is returning, and I want you to end up to be one who's pleasing. I want When you stand in front of him, you say, wow, man, I, I got all these things stored up for you. And besides that, when he returns, should we be a stranger to him? We're supposed to be learning what his voice sounds like right now. We're supposed to be walking with him in humbleness and, and fear of the Lord and reverence of him. He says he's going to split the eastern sky. He says he's going to come back in the clouds the same way he went up in the clouds matter of fact there was two angels that showed up and the, the disciples they're standing there and there he was he's, he's he's giving them this rendition of what they're supposed to do did you know while he's telling them what they're supposed to do he himself is preparing to leave the earth he's giving them instructions and their big question is well, when are you going to snap your fingers and, and make Israel the, the kingdom again where we can be in charge? You know what? He, let, let me read to you. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father has promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And I, I talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the evangelical world. Oh, well, that's not in Scripture. Did it say baptize in the Holy Spirit? So when they came together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it, is, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times 
or the seasons which the Father has fixed in his own authority. But you will receive power. He switches subjects. You know, he's talking about what they're supposed to do right now. They're wanting to know what they're supposed to do about you establishing something. And he says, I want you to know what you're supposed to do right now. He says, but you'll receive power, power to live, power to stop sinning. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then you shall be my witnesses, both to Jerusalem and to Judea and all Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So how important do you think his last words were? His last words were about how we're supposed to live. And it's in the Spirit. We're supposed to live and move and have our being in the Holy Spirit. Now, most of us, when we hear the word orotated like this, we're not writing down what the Holy Spirit instructs us this is called the spirit inspired gospel and what are we supposed to be doing we're supposed to be listening for the spirit inspired gospel why because then we're supposed to walk out and do it in obedience to the lord and if we're doing it in obedience to the lord what does that do to the soul you know the part of you you don't like the part of you that looks at something and Filled with hate and anger and rage and that part. What do you do with that part? Well, the way that gets purified is when we hear the revelational gospel preached, we say, yes, Lord, I want to do that. And when we come into agreement with him and do it, now purification comes in to our soul because we have obeyed the word. And when we've obeyed the word, now there's something else that takes place. Jesus says that if we're obedient to him, he will reveal himself to us. And then in us, and then through us. Isn't that what we're looking for? Do you want him to reveal himself to you? See, if we're struggling about the joys of life, of, well, life is just not full of joy. Watch because it's not full of him. The only part that's not joyous is me. So there needs to be less of me in it and more of him in it. <laughs> if I can get less of me, I can find joy. Every time I have made Jesus my only thing, not one amongst things, my only thing, then whatever else I needed, he added. But I had to make him my only thing, not in a group of things, chief amongst things. He's not satisfied with even first place with something else crowding him. He says, no, I want your life. I want to live my life through you. I want you to do the work I sent you to do. Now, can you imagine this? Uh, and during the uh, Russian, when the Russians were being attacked by the Germans, and boy, I'm, I'm telling you, they were Moscow really dug in. They lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 million people. The Russians did. They dug in and dug in and dug in. Now, their order was, the Germans are coming and they're fixing to level this place. Build trenches. Work hard. Build the trenches so the tanks can't make it through. Now, what was the directive of the city? Every man, woman, and child was out there doing it because if they didn't do it, it could cost them their lives if they didn't have perimeter defenses to shut down the tanks and the advances of the infantry. And what they were trying to do is stall till the winter got there. If they could get them in the winter, then they knew their machinery and stuff wouldn't work and they knew the, the Germans couldn't handle the cold. And, and, and it was a really good thought process. But my my my... My whole point is there was a command that came forth to work and do something. Now, that something was not manage their klobasi stand, whatever it is in Russian, for hot dog. Right? What was they supposed to be doing? Working for the common protection under one person, which was their leader, to accomplish something. Now, my whole thought process is if, we're, if we are not working for the Lord, then who are we working for? Ourselves. 
And if we're preserving ourselves, we are not obeying his commands. But yet, if I work for him in the process of doing something for him, now the provision that I wanted to take time to make, the little handful of change I had made there at Sam's hot dog stand, he has, oh, well, I, I've got something better for you. And here's more finances. Here's a better job. He, he has those things in mind. He knew we were going to be living in, on earth here. But now part of our hope that keeps us working for him and him alone. Jesus is supposed to be living in you. And Jesus wants to continue to do the Father's will through you. Part of the hope is his return. If he's returning, I don't want to be caught doing something that I shouldn't be doing. Now, the reason I'm telling you this, it's a, it's a stiff thing. It kind of catches us and prickles us. And I would say to you that your faith is supposed to be able to handle this because this is out of the Word of God. I can read you 17 pages of notes that I've got of all the scriptures that the Lord has to say about his return and about our preparation for that and our thought process for it. And that we're supposed to be dedicated to the purpose of his return and dedicated to living for him. And I would suggest to you, we don't have that capacity or capability unless we make him the love of our life. Jesus made the statement in the book of Revelation to one of the churches. He said, you've left your first love. So if you've ever had an encounter with Jesus, if I've left something, that means I had it. But that means I'm just, I walked away from it and I'm doing something else. He didn't say I lost my first love. He said I left my first love. And so I'm supposed to come back to Jesus and him alone. And in the midst of coming back to him, now the enthusiasm, the joy of life, the peace of life, the direction of life, and I get a new map that's not torn up. <laughs> and I have my next destination. Jesus wants to give you your next destination even before you leave here today. He wants you to be compliant to him. And his terms are not hard and they're not harsh. And if we would just obey the small map that he gives us and just go to the corner of 5th and Main, then he'll be there. Here's the next process. And he'll lead us through process by process of getting us off of the streets that are where the gutter was, where the self-will was, where, where our own thought process takes us away from God. Because what are we going to be facing when we walk up to the gate? Would we know him? The most important thing is that we know him. We're just barely getting to know him right now. We're his disciples, and it's since we're in the last day, I can't teach you anything different. It's imperative at this, this time that you understand your Lord is returning, and he's going to split the eastern sky, and he's going to come back with his host of angels, and his foot is going to touch down on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives is going to split in two, and he's going to establish his throne here, and he's going to make battle. He's going to fight against the nations. He's going to fight against everything on earth that's not for him doing in his, will, his way, his will, his way. He's going to be king. He's coming to be king of the earth. And so right now, if I can wrap my mind around, how do I make you king? I get the benefits of the king. I get the joy of the king. And I get to do, do the king's business. And I can, I can tell you, anybody who does the king's business does not lack anything. So I cannot put it off on serving him that I'm going to lack if I serve him. Quite the opposite. I will lack if I don't serve him. I will lack if I don't work for him. Now, I'm not trying to get you to sign up on some work list. I'm trying to get you to get on his page and do it his way. Because in the midst of that comes obedience and something we are going to need. We're going to desperately need. In 1 Thessalonians, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. I love that. They just found a gold nugget that's about the size of this ottoman right here in Mongolia. A guy found it with his metal detector. Pure gold, the size of that ottoman. They don't know how much it weighs because he won't release that. I'm sure it has to do with taxes and all that stuff. 
But my point is, is when Jesus Christ comes back, those who are dead in him come right out of the grave. Now, you ever been over to the junkyard? I used to love to go to the junkyard where they got metal. It's a metal yard. And they got this huge magnet thing. It swings around. And if something's made out of the right metal, it flies up in the air to meet it. And it takes it to its destination. But it has to be made out of the right metal. When Jesus returns, his giant magnet, if we're made out of the right stuff, we'll be pulled right out of the ground and meet him in the air. And if we're composite material, a bad material, and don't have enough of the right stuff, enough of the right metal, we will not be pulled up in the air to meet him. Now, for those of us who are left here on the earth, there is some things that we need to look at. I was going to give you a, a list of ten things in preparation. His purposes and his promises. And I talked about some of his purposes that he wants to establish his kingdom in you right now. He wants to become king. And then he also, at the same time, if we make him king, he wants to extend his promises. There is number six on your list. One of the things that need to be accomplished is the preaching of the gospel. He's going to come and interview you and say, why didn't you preach the gospel? Why didn't you take the gospel to anyone? The gospel came to you. The Holy Spirit convicted you. The Holy Spirit brought you to me. Why didn't you take that gift and give it to somebody? That's, on, that's, on, that's a big one on the list about his coming. We're going to be interviewed about why we were not involved because we are the only gospel bearers on planet Earth. The zebras weren't selected, neither were the monkeys or the giraffes. You were selected to be the one who would deliver the gospel, which means you have to be filled with the Spirit because the gospel has to be given through the power of the Spirit, right? So we've got to be obedient, receive the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, learn how to live in the Spirit. Matter of fact, Part of the gospel is us growing in the grace of God and the Spirit. So there's more and more truth of the gospel that's given to us as we walk in the Spirit. We're supposed to live and move and have our being what? In the Holy Spirit. So if I'm living and moving, having my being in the Holy Spirit. Now, number seven. We're supposed to pursue peace with all people and holiness. And without it, no one will see the Lord. Let me rephrase that for you. Whoever pursues peace with God and with people and are set aside for God and his family, we'll see God. This says the opposite. Those who don't do those things won't see God. Well, if those who don't do those things won't see God, then those who do do those things will see God. Do you want to see him? Do you want to have encounters? I've had many, many encounters with my Lord of seeing him. I've stood before him many times. I've been called up there, and I've shared a few of those experiences with you. I've ran into him more times than I can tell you here on earth. And sometimes in real awkward positions, I didn't have to wait for the second return. I was caught in real awkward thing. Oh, Lord, you're here. You shouldn't be here right now. And he said, no, you shouldn't be here right now. <laughs> Leave immediately. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're supposed to live in holy conduct and godliness, number eight. Number nine. We're supposed to live in peace. You know what peace is? Peace means that God picks up his baton. And I look and say, which instrument do you want me to play? And he said, that one. What music do you want me to read? Says, this page. What line, sir? This line. What bar, sir? This one. What note, sir? This one. How loud, sir? <laughs> and how long, sir? See, if... Those are the right questions to ask. They're always, how do you want it done? If we're asking, how do you want it done? He will be gracious to give us instructions about how to accomplish this. Number 10, in our waiting for him, the scripture says, let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. Anytime we are fooled, 
into going and starting our self-objective life, we have been deceived. And I can tell you, Satan can deceive us. The biggest person that deceives me is me. Not you, but me. And I love the statement. He said, let no one deceive you. We cannot deceive ourselves when we see something we want and justify it. Instead, we have to turn to the Lord and throw it away. Throw it away. Come and do it his way. He's given us instructions for life. He's given us instructions for life full of zeal. I was talking with somebody and uh, I was watching a little girl run around here and said, boy, I wish I had that energy. And I was just, uh, that little girl was just so chipper and happy and joyful and just like a canary. Uh, and, and, I, and I started talking to the person that I was with and I said, you know, you know, I can remember when I was a kid, we had nothing. We had no decent place to live, no decent clothes. No decent car, <laughs> no decent hope of any future, but it was the most joyous time. I can remember whenever I went for a walk with my mom, I skipped everywhere and whistled. Probably didn't sound very good, but joy was in me. Joy was just bubbling up in me. Why? Because God was there. And God was taking care of us. And I was conscious of the joy of his presence. Conscious of the joy of my mom's presence. And my family's presence. I was thankful for absolutely every little thing that we had. And I shared with you one time about mom opening a box of oatmeal. And she was, we were drinking out of little baby food jars. And little pint jars and stuff. That was our dishes. And she was telling me how great God was. That he, he had... He had given us something to eat this week. That's how tight things were. And showed me the box of oats. And when she opened it, she was talking about the riches of God and his treasuries and how he was blessed. There was this little green depression glass thing. Have y'all seen those? It, just, it looked like it was a hand-carved emerald about that big to a little four-year-old. And I can remember just becoming absolutely ecstatic of, oh, God, look what you gave to us. My mom took it out of the box. She said, this is yours, son. And I took it as just from my God. I went outside. There was a, We were living in an old motel court made in probably in the 20s or something like that. And it was a C-shaped and there was a swing set in the middle. I went out and I sang all the way to heaven. I worshiped God. I praised him. I thanked him. I made up songs. Why? I was so filled with joy. So filled with joy that the clouds parted. So filled with joy that I heard thousands upon thousands of angels singing. So filled with joy I caught my first glimpse of a heavenly Jerusalem in the sky. I have never stopped praising my Lord and nor do I fear about him bringing the new Jerusalem nor do I fear about the king of kings coming and splitting the eastern sky and riding on a white horse and, and making everything just and right. Isn't our misery and our sadness because things aren't just and right? Then shouldn't our joy be that he's coming and he's making things and will make things just and right and in that making things he's going to make things just and right in me. I have confidence he's going to make things just and right in me first. That's part of the process of us living with him right now. He's willing and wanting and desirous to make everything inside you just and right. We don't have to look at ourselves with shame and know our thought process. We don't have to look at ourselves in shame and, and know that we're cowards that don't want to work for God and don't want to do it His way. And that we're, we, we know that we're rebels, that we don't want to do it His way. Instead, when, when we with joy see that the kingdom can be built and see that He's made us an extension of it and see that our hands can grab hold of it and He's going to be standing there. And, and it's something that we can offer to Him. I've got one thing to share with you and I know somebody's pointing at their watch, but I've I got to share this with you. Do you realize... Abraham was favored of God. So favored of God that when Lot, his nephew, was absolutely captured in five kings with maybe fifteen to 50,000 men, depending on who you talk to, 
went out with 318 men and slaughtered the five kings and their armies, chased them all the way to the other side of Damascus, which was a couple of hundred miles, killing them. They were all dead. Didn't talk about any survivors on the other team. Didn't talk about anybody on this side that even got hurt. Even, even a sprained ankle. Man, I, I was wielding that sword for three days. My arm sore. There wasn't even a report of an arm being sore. <laughs> and my point was, immediately after that, can you imagine this? The Ancient of Days shows up. The priest to the Most High God. The priest that came down and stepped out of heaven and out of the presence of a living God is standing before Abraham and makes proclamation because God had been making promises to Abraham that had to do with the future. And Abraham, yes, you're God. Those promises will come to pass. But yet he hadn't seen those promises. And now his life was just rescued because he's seen what happened. And he saw Evidently, the angels that were there, because he knew that God had gone before him. He knew his life had been spared. His men's life had been spared. He knew his family had been rescued. And now he, he knew, that, my goodness, all the goods that those five kings had, and not just the goods from Sodom and Gomorrah, they had been going from city to city. Sodom and Gomorrah just had to be their last one in their chain before returning. There were several other cities that were attacked and been carried away. And Abraham comes back loaded with treasure, not hurt, realizing I am alive. And now the priest of the Most High God is standing there. And he makes declaration. His declarations are, I just left God. I just left his throne. And he declared in heaven and earth that you are blessed. And he declared, he is your God. Oh, you are so highly favored, Abraham. You are so highly favored. Abraham and his response of, Oh, God did all this. Here, you're going back. See, where's that? If the priest came from there, where's he going back to? He's the high priest. And what does the high priest do? He, he offers offerings. And Abraham said, you're the high priest. You're, you're fixing to go stand in front of him. Here, take a tenth of everything that there is. Because will you take it with him? Will you present it to him? Will you put it right before him there in the Holy of Holies? Will you give it to him? I think it was the first transfer of goods from the world into the spiritual. It's on record. I just think that is such a cool scene. Because it was not just some, some guy on a hill that raised goats that was so-called king he was king of righteousness he was a king of, of of everything that we can become and jesus if we make him king he can bring the righteousness that you need he can set you free and in part of that is the hope of oh lord come and in that us making him king now be king be king in my life be lord in my life be my great king shall we pray lord i thank you for being our great king I thank you for the hope of your return. I rejoice with you, Lord, that you offer to train us to be your workmen here on earth. To do something for you. All that I am, Lord, I, I give to you and your way and your will. Let your kingdom be established in me and in anyone who makes the prayer of, Lord, come and establish your kingdom. His hands are yours. His feet are yours. Help me make my mind yours. Help me into my obedience. For your goodness is chasing me down. He's been hunting me, and it has found me. Help I thank you for your direction. In Jesus' great and precious name. hearts and prayers of agreement in that respect. Lay your hands upon us, your people, and draw us to your side that we might know. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If anyone needs spirit, we'd be glad to lay hands on and pray for you. And you're dismissed. Be sure and have a neck and just if you turn the lights on back there.